recording. Welcome to session number, uh, oh, let's look here, session number eight in uh, biblical backgrounds. This is a study of uh, all kinds of stuff, uh, geography and archaeology and linguistics and anything else that I happen to add in that forms a part of the context and a part of the background for understanding the Bible. The Bible itself stands by itself, uh, but often we can find illustrations and applications and uh, a, a, a better sense of what's going on in the Bible by looking at the background. Uh, that's what we're doing. Hi, uh, and uh, I'm uh, Dr. John McMath, joined by my friends in Italy and in the Philippines, and we're glad to have you here today. I'm going to get uh, right into today's uh, material with uh, a shared screen. Let's see if I can make this work. Yeah, I'm calling today's lecture First Things, uh, and I'm doing that deliberately. Uh, because obviously the creation is the first thing. God stands outside of creation, but the creation itself is the first thing. Uh, and amongst the first things that philosophers talk about are all of the principles by which the universe appears to be governed. Uh, laws of logic and physics and math and biology, all of those things, as well as um, spiritual principles. Uh, it, it, not all of the secular thinkers agree that there are spiritual principles, but most of those who reject the spiritual principles also eventually find themselves rejecting the laws of physics and mathematics and logic. Uh, you know, so we're going to look at, at first things. And I'm going to do this uh, against a background of uh, the ancient world. Uh, the uh, ancient people were not stupid. Uh, they were uninformed but they were not stupid. And they recognized that the universe needed an explanation and that the great events which were a part of their tradition required an explanation. And so they tried. Uh, generally speaking, they were wrong, but they tried. And so we're going to look at the, uh, uh, the background, the ancient Near Eastern background of the first part of Genesis. In chapters 1 through 11 of Genesis, we see uh, the creation, the fall of man uh, in the Garden of Eden, uh, the flood, and the Tower of Babel, and the uh, confusion of languages. Uh, these things, of course, are rejected by the secular world. Uh, but frankly, even from a secular point of view, uh, these accounts make good sense. And that's a, a big part of the argument. Uh, I believe that these things are true in the literal sense, uh, not, uh, not merely because I like old stories, although I do. Uh, but these stories come from God. Uh, if we didn't have Jesus and the New Testament, uh, it might be a little harder to accept the truth of these ancient Jewish stories. We could say they just made it up. Uh, because they, the book of Genesis, and particularly the first parts of the book of Genesis, uh, provide Israel with an account of her own roots. Uh, the stories of the creation, the flood, the Tower of Babel provide an account that offers Israel 
a solid set of reasons for rejecting the pagan culture that surrounded them and to instead follow the god of reality. Uh, the, uh, those early stories were intended to form a foundation for the nation of Israel. But for us as Christians, it's clear also that Jesus himself believed that these things should be understood in a straightforward, literal way. Uh, Paul and the other uh, writing apostles took the stories of the creation of Adam and Eve and the rest as literally true. In fact, a, a careful reading of much of the New Testament, Romans 5, for example, makes it clear that the doctrine of salvation itself depends on a literal understanding of Adam and Eve in the garden. The creation is foundational to all of the rest of human thought. Uh, and uh, some of the early church fathers made the argument, uh, Athanasius, the most famous among them, uh, that uh, only the creator can be the redeemer of men. And the creation is the beginning of the material universe, but the new creation that Paul speaks of in uh, 2 Corinthians, uh, when we come to Christ, is the crown of creation. Uh, and in the end of time, there will be a new heavens and a new earth, a new creation of all things designed specifically for the redeemed. Uh, so the, the redemptive core of the Bible rests on the foundation of the literal truth of the first chapters of Genesis. So it's fairly important that and we, we really do have to, uh, uh, we really do have to deal with it. And we're going to deal with it today against a, uh, an ancient Near Eastern background. Uh, sometimes I speak of, uh, I use a term, the creation set. Set theory is the idea that you could put a bracket around a sequence of things and they become a single thing. Uh, so when I talk about the creation, I'm actually talking about a whole set of ideas uh, uh, in addition to the things themselves. And so the universe is created. Very good. That's a wonderful thing. But with the creation of the universe, uh, there were also laid down a set of first principles. First things, first principles, and what I'm going to call the creation set of first ideas. Uh, I'm going to argue, first of all, I'm, I'm going to look at some stuff here today, and this, 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 uh, this lecture is uh, not one I've given a lot of time, so I'm, I'm creating it as we go. But we start with the idea of logic itself. Uh, most people, uh, learn how to think logically uh, when they're little kids. At about the time that children lose their teeth and begin growing their permanent teeth, some hormones are doing other things in their bodies and in their brains, and they start thinking logically. Uh, those of us who are parents will recognize that in a child's ability to tell a joke. Uh, tiny children uh, often uh, say stupid things and think that it's humor, that it's funny. Uh, and uh, it, it's, it takes a while for them to understand a joke. Uh, and of course, every, uh, jokes are different in every language. Uh, I, I've discovered that uh, I, uh, although I've got a certain amount of Italian, I could never see the humor in an Italian comic strip when, uh, when I was over there a lot. I would pick up a paper and read the comics and nothing. You know, I understand what they're saying, but it's not funny. 
So there is there is something logical here. We're 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 moving from uh, what what is said to a reasonable conclusion that in humor is something funny. Well, logic is the basis of human thought uh, and uh, reasonable decision making. Uh, when when people are going through life and uh, they come to a uh, uh, to a fork in the road. They have to decide: Shall I go this way or shall I go this way? That's a, that's decision making. Uh, the The biblical word is crisis. We come to a fork in the road. We've got to go this way or that way. Which way shall we go? Well, that depends. Where do you Where did you start, and where are you heading? Uh, because this, the, the road to the right is going to take you one place, the road to the left will take you somewhere else. You need to evaluate the evidence. Look at a map, for instance. Get out your phone and set up the GPS. Uh, you need to look at the evidence. You need to look at the, uh, the presuppositions where you're trying to go. Uh, and then you can make a decision. This road to the left is likely to get me to my destination more quickly. It's as simple as that. Uh, and uh, in the universe as a whole, uh, there is a, there's an underlying sense of order that reflects the basic logic of God himself. So another way of saying this is that logic is the science of finding the truth. Now, in all of this, we, we begin by assuming that there really is truth. Uh, something is true and things that are not true are false. Uh, uh, people who tell us the truth are a different sort of people than those who would lie to us. Uh, there's a great deal going on here, but logic is the the science and the art, the skill of finding the truth. With the laws of logic, we argue to legitimate conclusions from the evidence that is set before us. Uh, so if you were to look at this garden, for example, uh, you, uh, it, you, you can see just by looking that it's a well cared for garden. Uh, that uh, somebody had a sense of symmetry. If you look at the stones that are uh, laid there, you would come to the conclusion that this is a very old garden, that it's been in that place for a good long time. If you were to uh, walk around and uh, do a little more study, you would find out that a great deal of engineering has gone into the construction of this garden. Uh, the, the pool that you see in the foreground uh, is fresh water. That means that the water is running out as well as running in. Uh, there's a, uh, a dam a little further back into the woods uh, that you can't see in this picture. Uh, the river slightly farther upstream uh, is uh, slightly dammed, some of the water is diverted into a kind of a mill pond, and that water flows out into this fountain. The fountain flows into the pool, and then underground channels take just enough water out of this pool all the time in order to keep the water fresh and clean. It's a fascinating thing. Uh, if, uh, if you were to come upon this fountain and pool uh, in your travels, you would probably not assume that it was natural. I mean, just look at it. Uh, the steps, the walls, the terraces, the pool itself, the engineering of the dam and the, and the pipes, you would say to yourself, somebody put this here. Uh, and they were trying to build a beautiful thing that was also practical. Uh, and you would be right. It was built in France in the 12th century by Cistercian monks who were uh, uh, trying to make their monastery beautiful. And I would say they did, a, they did an admirable job. 
logic is the art of looking at the evidence and coming to sound conclusions. Uh, and, and we're not going to look all through the laws of logic, but I would argue that God didn't create logic. Rather, logic is a reflection of the character of God himself. God is orderly, uh, and he, uh, he does things in a predictable uh, and in a trackable way. Uh, so when we look at the world, uh, there are some things that just make sense. Water runs downhill. It always does that. And there are reasons for that. Uh, and the physical creation of a hill down which water could run gave visible evidence of the underlying orderliness of God's mind. I would argue that everything that exists, everything that is true, has existed eternally in the mind of God. Well, that's a bit of philosophy. Uh, the uh, early church fathers like Augustine liked to say things like that because they, they believed in some other philosophers. Uh, Plato among them. Plato and Aristotle were the earliest, uh, or some of the earliest of the Greek philosophers, and they said some very important things. Plato, for example, uh, said that truth exists forever in the mind of the one. Uh, and the most important principle that comes out of Plato is that truth is non-contradictory. Every true proposition can stand on its own, but at the same time, it is related to every other true proposition. There's this intricate web connecting all true statements, uh, and God knows them all. And one of the characteristics of that set of truth is that no one truth can contradict any other truth. Uh, we sometimes call this the law of non-contradiction. It gives us a cross-check uh, on uh, truth. Uh, if, uh, if there is something that we know indubitably to be true, uh, for instance, uh, uh, my own existence, I can't meaningfully deny my own existence. It is undeniable and therefore undoubtable. I obviously exist. To then state nothing exists, which is the position of a, a philosophical school called nihilism, uh, is a contradiction in terms. <laughs> if I exist and yet nothing exists, then one of these statements is false, and the other, by definition, is true. Uh, yes. Plato says, nothing that is true can contradict any other thing that is true. This is one of the really important reasons that we need to learn to be consistent in our approach to uh, the Bible and to biblical teaching. When we develop a system of theology, those propositions that we lay down to teach one another and to our children need to support one another. They need to fit together into a whole system because, in fact, God's system of truth is always non-contradictory. So we've, we've got a cross-check. Uh, Paul says in Galatians chapter 1, verses 8, and also in verses 9, if anybody else, even as somebody who calls himself an apostle or an angel from God, were to try to teach you uh, some other gospel than I have taught you, let him be accursed. Well, how can Paul say that? If all religion is created equal, and we, we're just making it up as we go along, Paul wouldn't agree with that. He would say there are some things that are absolutely true. The gospel is true. Okay, so Plato would say 
truth is non-contradictory. Aristotle had a little different description of, uh, of the truth. He would agree with Aristotle, or he would agree with Plato. Plato and Aristotle were not really competing ideas. They worked together. But Aristotle would say the truth is an accurate description of reality. Truth is a clear summary of the evidence that we have observed. Plato wanted to start with universal truths and work down to specifics. Aristotle started with the truth of evidence, of experiment, and worked his way up to Plato's universals. Modern scientific method goes both directions. Uh, and I, I cannot emphasize enough that as, as Christians, we are not anti-scientific people. And when we read Genesis 1 through 11, we are not anti-scientific. Rather, we are looking for universal truth that explains the evidence that we actually see. Now, I would argue that when we discover, or when we read Genesis, we're discovering the first instances of quite a number of uh, uh, true propositions or universal principles that form the foundation of all of creation, all of life, uh, everything, everything that is real. Uh, and this foundation I call the creation set. Uh, obviously, if God created the universe, he created it with certain laws of physics and biology and mathematics and all of that. But there are also laws that are of the spirit. There are, because the universe is not merely a physical reality. It is also a spiritual reality. There are, there are principles that are universal that are not physical. Uh, we, uh, here in America, we used to uh, use a, a gospel tract that we called the four spiritual laws. And there are actually more than four spiritual laws. But the, the laws of the spirit are the most important of the first principles. I would argue that the laws on the spiritual level are more important than math and physics and biology, even though all of those things are true. I'm going to go a little further here and suggest that the first principles that go all the way back to Genesis 1 uh, have an uncanny reflection of the Ten Commandments. By the time we get to Exodus and Deuteronomy, we're going to get the Ten Commandments. Those things are implied in the first chapters of Genesis as universal, uh, for the most part, non-physical, but spiritual propositions. And this is primarily what I mean when I'm talking about the creation set. So let's look at these. Uh, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. Okay, how many gods are there? It was just one. And where did he come from? Well, he didn't come from anywhere. God simply is. When, when God starts out by saying, I am, he doesn't say, I have come into being, or I was created. God is uncreated. Uh, he simply is. He didn't create himself. He simply is. He cannot not be, to use a double negative to make uh, the emphasis. God can't not exist. He, ha he has to be in the present tense throughout all of eternity. Uh, and at that level, the Bible starts off with, in the beginning, which refers to the beginning of the physical universe, in the beginning, God. God necessarily, as the subject of that sentence, stands outside of the created universe. He is, by definition, supernatural. The 
second laws, you shall make for yourselves no graven images. Well, why? Because God is outside of the created universe. When we make idols for ourselves, uh, material objects to worship, or when we begin to worship the created universe as more important than the creator, which is something that environmentalists do, when we worship politicians more than the creator, which is something that totalitarians do, uh, when, when we worship uh, the gaining of financial security more than the creator. We're making graven images. We're worshiping idols. We're rejecting the idea that there is an eternal God who exists outside of this created universe. So the first two commandments uh, fit there. The third commandment has to do with taking the name of the Lord God in vain. Vain means uh, for nothing. You shall not take the name of Yahweh your God for Sheva. Sheva is uh, a word that means emptiness or vanity. Uh, in other words, we should always take God seriously. Uh, always at uh, all times and in every circumstance, God is to be taken seriously uh, because he is not a tame lion. He will not hold him blameless who does not take him seriously. Uh, remember the Sabbath. The, the uh, fourth commandment often gets overlooked, uh, but it has primacy of place uh, in the Ten Commandments. It's the fourth of the laws that focus on uh, our relationship with God himself. And it's a fairly important commandment. What's the point of the Sabbath? Take a moment to remember that God created the universe in seven days. Every week, we should take a moment, at least, to consider the object lesson. Look at the creation. Uh, this gigantic thing made out of nothing at all in seven days flat. And God had time in that seven days to take a day off. Uh, remember the Sabbath to just for a moment consider that God created all of this for his own glory. That is to make himself visible. So when we look at the objects themselves, and more importantly, the principles behind the object, we're considering God himself. Remembering the Sabbath is, is important for that reason. Now, I believe the Sabbath is still on Saturday. Uh, I, I think taking a, a bit of time off to get, uh, to get away with God is important, uh, but it's not it's not a religious obligation. I think it's wrong for us as, uh, as Christians to, te uh, to treat uh, Sunday as the Sabbath. It isn't. Uh, Saturday was always the Sabbath day. Uh, but it's also wrong for us to treat Saturday as some kind of a holy day where we can't work and we have to go to church and sit quietly. I don't think that was ever the biblical idea. The biblical idea has to do with resting in the completed work of God. God has done the work, so we don't have to. We can trust him, not only for our salvation, but for all of life. Uh, often in the modern world, that is the most important thing. The fifth commandment is interesting. Uh, it, uh, it said, remember your father and mother, treat them with honor your father and your mother. The family is at the core of humanity and of creation itself. Uh, the, the creation of Adam and Eve as male and female happened on the sixth day of the creation week. Happens at the end of chapter one of Genesis. 
it's obviously of the essence. Uh, the family is at the core. The maleness and femaleness of the human race and of the rest of creation is not an accident. This isn't an afterthought. God didn't create the, uh, the human race and then decide uh, to uh, add genders. Uh, yes, the, the modern Facebook uh, compilation. What, what does Facebook allow these days? 67 different genders. Uh, that's uh, literally, not merely figuratively, but literally stupid. <laughs> Anybody who can count knows how many genders there are. There's a grand total of two. Uh, there are boy type people and girl type people. There aren't any others. There are confused people who happen to be girls or boys, but confused people don't change the rules. Uh, no, matter, <coughs> no matter how much uh, the, uh, the media, uh, the ruling class, uh, the politicians, and the rest of them want to tell us otherwise. The family is at the core. Uh, and the idea of the family is to give mankind and the rest of life on earth the capacity for sending life forward into future generations. Uh, the, uh, the mortality of the individual is conquered by the ability to produce a family and share forward into the world. So it's at the core. Because of that, you shall not commit murder. Life is sacred. It is quite literally a gift of God. Uh, in uh, uh, Genesis 2, when uh, God kneels down next to the clay man that he has made and breathes life into him, life comes directly from God. You must not uh, lightly take life. Uh, later on, when God gives Noah the responsibility of capital punishment, uh, that is a heavy burden at a major responsibility, uh, and no one should ever take that lightly. Uh, I, uh, I hate the war going on uh, right now in Ukraine for exactly these reasons. Uh, that's a terrible thing to have to do. Uh, and I, I've been in Russia, I know a lot of Russian people, uh, and I feel very, very badly for what they're being forced to do right now. Uh, the, this thing is wrong. Uh, and the Ukrainian people are fighting back for their lives and for their, uh, for their nation. I don't blame them for fighting back. I feel very badly that they're forced into this. This is a terrible thing. Uh, and, um, uh, so life is sacred. You shall not murder. Don't take life uh, lightly. Beyond that, uh, did I mention that the family is important? You shall not commit adultery looks back to the sacredness of the family. Uh, the relationship between a husband and a wife uh, is central to God's plan for eternity. It's at the core. Uh, this, this, is, this is who we are as a people, and we must not ever take that lightly or play around with that. Uh, uh, using the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the physical relationship that ought to exist between man and wife, uh, simply as uh, recreation outside of marriage or before marriage uh, is, is a very sad thing. Uh, and to, to do these things in the a variety of uh, modern preferences uh, is blasphemy. It's a terrible thing. Uh, so you shall not commit adultery. Uh, this, is, this is core. Uh, you shall not steal. Uh, Adam is commanded to work the ground and to eat the fruit of the ground that he earns by the sweat of his brow. 
what Adam earns by the sweat of his brow belongs to Adam. And he can share that with his family. But that belongs to Adam. I have no right to take it from him. Not even if I'm, if I'm responsible for a great big government with lots of bureaucrats to feed. Uh, I don't have the right to steal. Uh, the, uh, the, the right of personal private property is basic, is one of the creation principles. Always tell the truth. Don't ever lie. Uh, this is so important. We, uh, God is a truth teller, and Christians ought to be in love with the truth. Uh, I always care about the truth. Uh, even when the truth hurts. In the garden, God told Adam the truth and made him face the truth. Have you eaten from the tree I told you not to? Well, and I ate. Thank you, Adam. That's all I wanted. Don't lie. Uh, the, the truth is of the essence. And then finally, uh, let's see if I can make it say one last thing. Be satisfied with what God has given you. Don't covet. What God has given you is going to be enough. I'll be happy with what God has given you. So contentment. It's hard to do in the modern world, but it's of the essence. I would argue that all of this put together uh is a is the creation set of uh, these principles these spiritual principles stand behind all of the physical principles uh, the laws of physics don't make any sense if these things are not true and so all of this works together most of the pagan approaches to origins betray an ignorance of these first principles. Uh, they, they realize that uh, creation has a cause, uh, but they, they miss most of the rest of the principles. So let's start in Egypt. Uh, Egypt is fascinating. Uh, the, the major the major backgrounds for first things are going to be in the Middle East. I'm mostly going to point you at Egypt and Mesopotamia, because we see a whole bunch of stuff that comes out of this area. Uh, Egyptian creation accounts are uh, many. Uh, this particular uh, bit of wall painting is from the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Uh, and there's a pharaoh on the right who is uh, getting ready to become a god, and his heart is being weighed in the balance on the left, and there's all kinds of stuff going on. This is an interesting little bit of wall painting. Uh, but along the way, we get the story of creation. So in, uh, in Egypt, we have several different uh, creation accounts. There's a creation by a god by the name of Ptah, who is the uh, protector of the city of Memphis which is today Cairo. Uh, and he was the number one God. Uh, and he's said to be the source of all of the other gods, especially uh, a God by the name of Atum, who is elsewhere called the creator. So some would say the universe was created by Ptah. Some would say, no, he's created by Atum. There are actually two different uh, uh, creation uh, stories. There are several other. Uh, the Book of the Dead, uh, which we see here, attributes creation to Atum. And he was alone on a hill before the heavens had been separated from the earth. He first created himself, and then he created the other gods. Do you see the contradiction there? Uh, nothing can be self-created. Uh, there, there is no such thing. In order to create yourself, you have to first exist outside of yourself. And that's 
that's illogical, it's irrational. Uh, and anybody who believes that has probably got some other problems. Uh, and uh, there's another creation account, uh, also a creation by a tomb that has a tomb standing up on a hill and creating the other gods by sneezing, literally. He goes, achoo, or atum. And here we've got other gods coming into being. Uh, this uh, image uh, shows yet another god, Amun Re. And Amun Re is actually two different sun gods. Amun is the northern Nile, and Re or Ra is the southern Nile sun god. The sun rises in the east at the top of <coughs> this image. And then there are two goddesses who are providing water to the earth. Uh, and where did the goddesses come from? Where well, we're not told. Uh, and the water is a gift of the goddesses, and there it is. And this is supposed to be an account of creation. Uh, in another spot, uh, we see a hymn to Amun Re. Uh, apparently, we don't know how to uh, to uh, uh, sing it. Uh, who is the sun god? He's the one in the uh, in the center with the uh, the hawk or Horus head uh, with the sun over the top of his head. And all of these gods, there were there are well over 5,000 Egyptian gods, all of them uh, credited with some role in the creation of certain things. Uh, what I want you to notice from the Egyptian stories is that the Egyptian creation counts are lacking in precision and they don't agree without, uh, with one another. They're routinely self-contradictory. Uh, uh, the Egyptians apparently had no particular care about logic. Okay. Uh, in Mesopotamia, we have a, uh, uh, a creation story, uh, actually several different creation stories, but one of the most famous is called the Enuma Elish. And uh, this, uh, this tablet in the background is the Enuma Elish. Uh, and there's a variety of ways of telling the story, but Tiamat and Apsu are the primeval gods. Tiamat is the female type and Apsu is the boy type god. Uh, and uh, they were of course lovers. Uh, and uh, they, were, uh, they were the, the gods before all of the other gods were born. Uh, and uh, they uh, hadn't given birth to any other gods yet uh, when uh, Tiamat and Apsu had a big argument. And apparently uh, Tiamat uh, hired another unexplained god by the name of Ea to kill Apsu. Uh, so Ea is the hitman. Uh, the story has uh, you know, some unexplainable parts, uh, but it's at least a good story. Uh, Tiamat uh, went on a rampage against uh, Ea and all of the other gods. Uh, where did the other gods come from? We're not told, but there they were. Uh, so uh, Tiamat is uh, uh, turning into a monster god uh, going after all of the other gods. And so amongst the gods, uh, uh, one of the gods, Marduk, uh, is set out to be the leader of the threatened gods. And he kills Tiamat, splitting her into like a shellfish. <clears throat> so Marduk the conqueror then proposes the creation of mankind to provide sacrifices for the gods. Because how are we gods going to get plenty to eat unless uh, we make some servants, some slaves uh, to... Uh, uh, send us provisions, and that's what the sacrifices are. Uh, uh, Tiamat had a son by the name of Kingu, uh, who had shared in her rebellion. Uh, and so Marduk killed Kingu and used his blood to be made into all of mankind. Tiamat, by the way, is a, uh, a word that means the deep or the saltwater ocean. Apsu is the freshwater uh, and Tiamat is the saltwater. 
uh, in uh, the, the theory is that when Apsu died, Tiamat uh, created the oceans uh, by uh, crying because she's a widow now after hiring a hitman to take care of Apsu. <coughs> the whole story is a little crazy, uh, but it's, it's kind of a colorful story. It's, a, it's kind of fun. Uh, this is another illustration uh, of the uh, Enuma Elish story. Uh, so you've got a variety of gods here chasing the mighty sea serpent. Interesting that uh, Tiamat is often pictured as a mighty sea serpent. Uh, and uh, here we have uh, 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 Marduk going after uh, uh, Ea, or perhaps uh, Tiamat, hard to tell, but the god on the right is, uh, is Marduk, who ends up becoming the chief of the gods. Okay, what can we say about, uh, about the Mesopotamian and about the Egyptian? Um, first of all, there are some superficial similarities, uh, but really superficial. Uh, one is that creation happened. You know, the heavens and the earth exist. It's tough to deny that. So something happened that the creation uh, happened. Uh, the other similarity is that the name Tiamat, uh, the original saltwater goddess, has the same root as the Hebrew word translated the deep in Genesis 1-2. Um, uh, there, there, there was darkness over the face of to home the deep. Uh, it's the same root. Uh, <coughs> and uh, so the, the scholars have, of course, in their wisdom, uh, said Moses must have uh, copied the Enuma Elish. Uh, well, if you take time to read Genesis and then take time to read Enuma Elish, you can see that the, the differences are gross. Uh, Genesis is obviously independent of the uh, Enuma Elish, even though Enuma Elish was written probably 500 years before Genesis was put down in, uh, on paper. Uh, Genesis isn't dependent on the Enuma Elish, uh, but the creation still happened. Okay, let's think about the Garden of Eden for a second. Uh, the location of the biblical Garden of Eden is something that we're not likely to figure out. <coughs> People have uh, suggested a variety of different locations uh, for the Garden of Eden, which is kind of fun. Uh, Ohio has been suggested. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure why, uh, but uh, there was a, a, a group, one of, the, uh, uh, one of the cults, I believe the Mormons, uh, suggested that the Ohio River uh, should be identified with the Garden of Eden. Maybe it's the Chamber of Commerce in Ohio. Uh, some have suggested that the Garden of Eden had to be on the planet Mars. I think that's also crazy. Uh, some have suggested that the Persian Gulf country of Bahrain should be it, or Iraq uh, with uh, Mesopotamia, or the Jordan Valley. This photograph is taken in the northern part of the uh, Jordan River Valley near the Sea of Galilee. Uh, and this is a spot that's been suggested by uh, some uh, Jewish investors uh, as the original Garden of Eden. It's a nice place. I think they intend to build a water park there, but it's not, it's not. Uh, however, it is really interesting to see how often uh, in antiquity, uh, we see uh, images of a garden and of a tree of life. Uh, the archaeological record is actually full of this stuff. Uh, I saw a display in the uh, British Museum in London uh, one time. It didn't take enough pictures to bother with, uh, but uh, there's a display of all of the tree of life stuff that they've come up with in uh, their uh, searches. This particular tree of life uh, is found on a mosque in Egypt. Uh, and I, I took that picture some years ago. That's down in, uh, uh, along the Nile in, uh, in Egypt. Uh, 
It's very, very ancient story, much older than the mosque. Uh, this is the way the Egyptians would have drawn this. This is a, a tomb painting that shows the first parents of the gods. Uh, and so we've got the Adam character on the left and the Eve character on the right. Uh, and the Adam character is handing out life. He's standing up there in the tree of life. Uh, and the, uh, uh, the uh, first of the other gods uh, to get life uh, is that uh, hawk god on the ground, who is the sun god Ra, or Amun Re. <coughs> that's, that's cute. And so you've got a picture of an Adam character and an Eve character and their firstborn uh, in the garden. How cool is that? Here's another picture of the same scene. It's an entirely different thing, but you've got uh, the Adam character. This one happens to be Amon Ray, and you've got an Eve character uh, who, in this case, is uh, oh, no, I can't, I can't remember this one, but it doesn't really matter. And uh, the uh, child god is the one in the middle. So again, the tree of life and the family in the garden. What's interesting to me uh, looking at this this is a tomb painting from the 18th dynasty uh, and the uh, uh, the Adam character uh, is uh, wearing a uh, kilt type garment with a tail it looks like a lion's tail the Eve character on the right has got a pair of paws and a tail hanging from her skirt obviously their clothing was made from animal skins. Hmm. Okay, and this was this is completely independent of uh, Moses and Genesis and all of the rest. Uh, where did they ever get an idea like that? What a crazy idea that is! Uh, I haven't had the opportunity to track this one all the way down. I'm sure there are papers written about this particular wall painting. Uh, and uh, most likely they, it, they will demonstrate that uh, Moses stole also from the Egyptian uh, polytheistic religions. <coughs> I doubt it uh, again. Anyway, that's uh, uh, similar stuff. Uh, this next image is from Babylon. It's actually one of Nebuchadnezzar's uh, paintings or uh, uh, reliefs. And there is the council of the gods, a whole bunch of gods getting ready to create some more gods. Uh, and they're standing in the midst of a garden with the tree of life right in the middle. Um, similar imagery, garden imagery with a tree of life in the middle is found in China, is found in uh, isolated people groups in India, is found in Scandinavia, in uh, some of the Norse mythology, is found in Ireland, in the Celtic mythology. It's all over the place. Uh, so this, this picture of our two original parents in a garden with a tree of life uh, seems to be virtually universal. Okay, after uh, Adam and Eve fell, we begin having a, a series of characters. Adam is the first, and Noah is the tenth of the early genealogy. We find this in Genesis chapter five. And in that chapter, uh, what is what we call the, uh, uh, the pre flood patriarchs. Uh, these 10 have very long lives, often as long as 900 plus years. So long life spent. And of course, the critics don't believe any of that. Uh, but a nice cross reference uh, is something that goes way back to the Sumerian period. This is called the Sumerian King List. This is a list of, uh, of uh, uh, 10 long lived patriarchs uh, who lived from the time of the creation until the time of the flood. Uh, so the, the Sumerians believed that there was a time of creation when man first began to live on the earth. 
and uh, when kingship came down from the gods, <laughs> okay? And uh, 10 generations in, or eight generations in some of the versions, uh, there is a terrible flood that killed everybody and resulted in much shorter lifespans. Uh, the, the account is clearly uh, fictional. Uh, when, when we read this thing, they, uh, there are at least three different versions, and the three versions don't even agree in all of, their, all of the subversions. Uh, in some versions, there are eight kings, some versions there are 10 kings. The, uh, the total length of time in the Sumerian versions is anywhere from 245,000 years to 450,000 years. <clears throat> the, uh, the kings are all kings of Sumer. Uh, most of them, uh, most of the names of these characters are actually drawn from the historical names of the kings of, uh, of city-states of the Sumerian region. Uh, so they probably all lived more or less at the same general time of history, and they undoubtedly didn't live nearly so long. This is mythology. And the point of the Sumerian mythology is to provide political legitimacy to the current dynasty of of Ur. This is the, this image is a thing called the standard of Ur. And it shows, among other things, uh, the history of Sumer, going back to all the generations prior to uh, the present. And it's, it includes the flood, it includes everything else, uh, a bunch of wars and other stuff. <coughs> but it's clearly political. We have power to rule over you because this came down to us from the gods. The flood itself uh, is a, a very big, uh, it, it's a very big story in the Bible. Uh, it uh, uh, takes up uh, four chapters of Genesis. There's, there's more about the flood than there is about creation. Uh, it's, so it's a, it's a fairly important and very primary story in the Bible. Uh, the flood is described as the result of God's anger and God's intention to destroy the entire human race. The Bible talks about a universal flood, uh, the whole world uh, destroyed. The result of the flood described in Genesis uh, has to be called cataclysmic or catastrophic. Uh, uh, to such an extent that literal geologic structures, the shape of the earth itself was transformed uh, at fundamental levels. Uh, the rest of the Bible looks back to Genesis 6 through 9 as a fundamental historical narrative. Uh, it, it should go without saying that uh, Jesus and afterwards the apostles understood Genesis 6 through 9 as history in exactly the same way that creation is history. Uh, in ancient literature, we have other examples of a flood story. Uh, this uh, broken tablet that you see is one of our best examples of uh, Tablet 11 of the Gilgamesh epic. Uh, the Gilgamesh epic, uh, I believe, goes for 11 tablets. It might be 12 tablets. I've, I've forgotten. Uh, it's written in cuneiform. It's kind of a wedge-shaped writing in clay. Uh, and uh, Gilgamesh is uh, uh, one of the kings of, uh, of uh, either Sumer or Babylon, depending on the version. And Gilgamesh uh, is a... Uh, is a, a, a quite quite a guy. He's probably a real king. Uh, uh, we think he lived during the fifth dynasty of Uruk in uh, Mesopotamia. Um, be that as it may, it, the the point of the story uh, is uh, political legitimacy. Uh, Gilgamesh may or may not have been uh, a hero in real life, uh, but 
the politicians need some support. And so the story was made up. Uh, the, um, <clears throat> the story about Gilgamesh uh, shows him as a, a very wild kind of king, a, a, uh, a Vladimir Putin kind of a king. Okay, he's a, uh, he's a fighter, he's a lover, he's a, he's a liar, he's corrupt. <clears throat> he's an amazing character. He has adventures involving monsters, and prostitutes, gods and goddesses, nonstop partying. Uh, Gilgamesh is uh, not what you and I would consider uh, a role model. <laughs> but in the ancient world, Gilgamesh is the obvious role model. And uh, his story is one of the oldest of a type of literature we call the heroic quest. So Gilgamesh goes off on a quest and he had a lot of adventures. And at one point along the way, he begins to fear for his life. You know, one too many strikes by a seven headed monster. And he begins to wonder if he's ever going to die. And uh, in the process, he goes looking for the secret of eternal life. And in his inquiries and adventures, he's told uh, that there is someone who in fact uh, once discovered the secret of eternal life. And this character's name is either Utnapishtim or Zusudra, depending on the language in which this story is told. But we'll use Utnapishtim, which is the Sumerian name. Zusudra uh, is actually Sanskrit. Uh, but it, it's told in a variety of different languages. It's an interesting guy. Utnapishtim is the, um, uh, is the Babylonian or Sumerian Noah. Uh, Utnapishtim actually built an ark and survived the flood. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> uh, we're told all kinds of stuff about the flood. Uh, and the, the narrative of the flood itself bears a certain superficial resemblance to the Genesis narrative. Uh, the gods told Utnapishtim that there was going to be a big flood. Uh, and uh, he was supposed to build a boat and he built it uh, cubicle, uh, like, a, like a dice uh, and uh, very large. Uh, and uh, he brought as many animals as he could into that with him. And he and his family got into this boat uh, and after a while, they got out uh, and uh, started over again. So there are some, there are some similarities. Uh, a lot of specifics are exactly the same. Uh, <clears throat> so Gilgamesh eventually went off and found uh, Utnapishtim. Unfortunately, uh, uh, Utnapishtim lost the secret to eternal life. That was one of the most important things he discovered in the process, but he lost it. Uh, so, so, pity, <laughs> I've lost it. Uh, we don't have that anymore. Uh, uh, of course, the critics believe that Genesis was borrowed from the Gilgamesh epic, uh, which is, again, impossible. The resemblances between the pagan narratives and the biblical narrative can best be explained by the fact that both are looking back to the same real event. Genesis looks back with the help of God. All of the others look back with pure, pagan, adulterated, uncommon lack of sense. Uh, they want to make everybody a party animal or a politician. Uh, and uh, neither of those is particularly admirable. Okay, where are we going? Okay, here's some pictures. This is uh, <clears throat> uh, Utnapishtim in his ark. And here's another picture of uh, Utnapishtim gathering materials to build his ark. Uh, there's a, a type of uh, ark in the background. This is an, an entirely different thing. Okay, uh, the, uh, 
uh, the Babylonians, the Sumerians before them, remembered the same story, but they remembered it quite badly. Uh, quick mention of uh, flood geology. Uh, if, uh, if the flood really happened, it would have been a major effect on the geology of the whole world. Uh, this photograph was taken in the Grand Canyon in the Southwest United States. Uh, it's a spectacular location for viewing the whole sequence of the sedimentary layers from the modern surface all the way back to the volcanic basement rocks at the bottom. It's apparent <clears throat> that the Grand Canyon sequence was put down by water. Uh, there are literally fossils everywhere. <clears throat> this is a mile thick. Uh, the entire sequence is three kilometers thick. Uh, uh, sedimentary rock, sandstone, limestone, shale, and conglomerates of various kinds. Uh, it's, a, uh, uh, it's an astounding thing. It's also clear that the, uh, the Grand Canyon is part of a worldwide catastrophic event. Some of the formations that you see in this photograph uh, also exist, the same material in other parts of the world. For example, in the Sinai Peninsula, I observed bits of sandstone, outcroppings of sandstone, where there are some inscriptions that are the same sandstone as we find in the Grand Canyon. This is worldwide. Uh, and uh, the Grand Canyon actually is trying to give us a, a history of the world. When we get all the way to the bottom of the Grand Canyon, three kilometers down from the surface, well, we find the basement rock, layers that belong to the very earliest events of all of histories. I like to say these are God's rocks. Uh, on, it, on the very first day when God created the heavens and the earth, these were the rocks that he created. Uh, they're the very earliest. The layers that we see in the Grand Canyon are a reminder of God's power in judgment. He created the heavens and the earth. He can also destroy. He is not a tame lion. Tower of Babel is the account for after the uh, uh, flood. The flood happens. Noah got out of the ark. Uh, in the, uh, the mountains of Urartu or Ararat, uh, he and his family went toward the south and east, uh, toward what we think of as Sumer. Somewhere in this area, a later generation during the time of Ham probably built the Tower of Babel. Uh, this, uh, uh, we don't know what the, uh, the tower actually looked like. This is the tower at Ur, and it's called a ziggurat. It's a platform tower. We don't know for sure. Uh, the Migdal of, uh, of Genesis is actually a defensive work. This, this ziggurat would not have been used that way. Nevertheless, they built a, they built a tower to protect themselves and perhaps to get closer to the gods. Uh, significantly at this time, the languages of earth were confused. And on this Google Earth photograph, we see the whole earth. We can see uh, where the original languages were confused. The sons of Shem speak languages that we call Semitic. Probably the original confusion was into three language groups. And uh, Shem and his descendants <coughs> stayed in the Middle East. As time went on, different Semitic languages developed. So Arabian and uh, Akkadian and Canaanite and whatnot, Hebrew ultimately, but they're all related. Those who went south were the sons of Ham. And so we call the, the uh, languages of Africa primarily Hamitic and Egyptian is a Hamitic language. 
Japheth went to the north. His first settlement area was in the Indus Valley uh, of uh, India. Uh, we call his language Japhethite or Indo-European. And all of the languages of India, of China, of Mongolia, uh, of uh, Central Asia, of Europe, developed originally from Japheth and his language in the Indus Valley. And this is why people who study Greek uh, often will study Sanskrit as well. And people who study Cantonese often find reflections of the original Sanskrit, that it's all a similar language. Uh, now, there are complexities that are not reflected here. Modern linguists have a lot to teach us uh, that, uh, that wants to complicate this matter. But the ultimate base of linguistic differences on the earth can be explained from Shem, Ham, and Japheth getting off the ark and speaking ultimately different languages after the Tower of Babel. Okay, prior to Abraham, the chronology has always been a little controversial. Uh, conservatives have always taken a uh, position that the chronology is fairly young. Bishop Usher in the uh, 19th century, an Anglican bishop, <clears throat> added up the genealogies and came up with 4004 BC uh, for a creation date. Uh, most modern conservatives are uh, not so accepting of that date, uh, but we would argue that uh, creation is fairly recent in the five to 6,000 uh, BC range. Uh, a, uh, a, a less conservative group the Institute for Creation Research, which I have great respect for, uh, insists on a creation uh, in the range of 10 to 20,000 BC. Uh, and they have good arguments for that. The secular world uh, holds that the earth was created or came into being uh, an extremely long time ago on the order of 20 billion years ago. The problem with 20 billion years ago is that it doesn't work very well. That's an awful lot of years. Uh, and we really only have history, real history, back to about 3,500 BC. And before that is prehistory. We really can't go much beyond the flood. Uh, with our history. And uh, before the flood, maybe 2,000, 2,500 years. That makes sense to me. Uh, so I'm happy with, uh, with an Answers in Genesis or an Institute for Creation Research, fairly recent date for the creation. Uh, the, the actual length of time doesn't matter, but a recent date fits the, the biblical data and, frankly, the scientific data very well. Okay, I've gone a little long. I'm going to stop the share right here and unmute us all. You guys are such a good audience. It's 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 fun to uh, it's fun to teach you. Uh, thanks for showing up. I, I uh, appreciate you all very much. Hope this is helpful. Uh, we'll be back on Wednesday. And we'll get into the wilderness wandering and the conquest narratives. There's a ton of stuff there. I'm going to condense it down. We look forward to seeing you all again. Okay, hit man, Donna has managed right. with us. Thank you, Dr. John. Bye. Bye bye, everybody. Love bye, you. bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.